Uh, next up, we have a, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Shooter. He's been to uh, my farm in Illinois. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun uh, meeting with each other at the no-till conferences and other conferences we've been to together. And he's, uh, he's a farmer and also uh, an inventor and, and really is looking at uh, doing things in, in new and productive ways. So if you would, put your hands together for Mike Shooter. Thank you, Mike, for, for the invitation. It's a very humbling experience for me to be invited to speak at something like this. Dave Brown, Dr. White, both of them are artists. Point that I can get through my presentation in the 17 minutes on the lot here. A uh, little bit about our operation. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> our two sons that are in the operation with us. <clears throat> Personal note, uh, December of 2014, I had a quadruple bypass surgery. I started out the first of that month with pneumonia and mild heart attack. I had no worries about the operation while I was in the hospital. These two guys took care of me. Actually, during that time, they started an investment with another couple or another another family into a meat market. So it's. It's uh, doing some of the things Gabe's talking about and selling your own meat. So. But like I said, these two guys, uh, top-notch guys, I couldn't, I couldn't hire this kind of help anywhere. So, especially in our area with unemployment like it is, not as bad as where Gabe's at, but just about as bad. <clears throat> the one piece I want to make a statement of is. I could have not gotten through December of 2014, and there's a reason that, that I was left here on Earth, and, and what we're talking about today, what we're doing today, what, what work we're doing is, is a big reason that he left me here on Earth to try to help other producers understand what we're doing in this industry now. Um, this is another reason that, that we're doing what we're doing. This is, he's about uh, five now, <clears throat> but at two or three, he was in the, he was in the sprayer with dad, working on Papa's spot in the sprayer, I think. But, and then this is, uh, he, this one here is now 11 years old, spent every day this fall that he was not in school in a grain cart by himself catching the combine dumping on the trucks and after they after they he ran fall break in soybeans and he didn't have a bean on the ground I told him that he was now a certified grain cart operator there are differences between grain cart operators and grain cart drivers and, and he's gotten to that point uh, also he's he did a couple years ago he did a book report on the man John Deere and uh, after that book report, he said, Papa, I think I want to go to Purdue, which is a good thing, and study uh, ag engineering and go to work for John Deere to work on autonomous tractors. Well, it's probably a good goal, Jacob, but autonomous tractors are going to be all, this, all that there is out there by the time you get through school. So, uh, But both of them, both of these two, and then we've got a two and a half year old that uh, I think all three of them are going to want to farm. So that's that's a big reason. Uh, I'm third generation on this farm. Uh, these two guys will be the fifth generation and and I hope we can keep it going a lot longer. <clears throat> Operation is roughly 3,200 acres. Uh, we now have either inorganic or transitioning to organic about about 20% of that operation. Um, we're, we're trying to do organic no-till, which if anybody can come up with a harder way of farming, would you please let me know? Because I think that's about as hard as it gets. Uh, we're dependent on Mother Nature to make sure we get, get our cover crops established right and, and do the things we need to do to get the, the, 
nitrogen and weed control that, that we need to get. But a lot of what Gabe's been talking about and what Dr. White's been talking about is really what's making this all possible. We've been uh, no-tilling for 35 years now. Uh, we've been strip-tilling in our regenerative operation for 15 years, and we've been using cover crops very extensively for eight years now. So uh, that's kind of where our operation's at. This is a, a picture of, of our strip-till unit. We um, built a 24-row strip-till bar, um, but that's in, in an area that probably drowned out um, in the field, and I had a good friend years ago told me, his dad always told him that there wasn't no reason to replant a field, spot in the field, it was going to drown out again if it drowned out the first time. So we've taken that philosophy and seeded a 12, 14, 18-way cover crop cocktail mix in that part of the field, and it's just amazing how much that improves the drainage in in that part of the field. That's that's the that's the steel we're putting in the fields, the cover crops we're using to, to do that with. Um, very diverse cover crops. Uh, I've got a list of them here in a little bit. But it's, it's amazing what we can do with cover crops in, in improving drainage, improving the tilth of the soil. Uh, with 35 years of no-till, one of the first things we learned four or five years down that road was we can be out in that field a lot earlier in the fall to harvest after a good rain than what anybody, <coughs> what anybody that's working the ground can be. Um, and and it just keeps improving that way. A um, little bit about the, the food web. Some of this has been gone over. Um, a lot of what we're, we're looking at here is just the diversity in, in what the f cover crops are feeding uh, underground. I uh, you know Gabe said this morning that uh, a spoonful of soil has more organisms in it than, than there are people in the world right now, and I've heard that for several years, and, and I'm beginning to understand what's going on with a lot of what Dr. White was talking about this um, where we're taking photosynthesis, putting the sugars in the in the plant, going down to the plant, extruding them, and and feeding the bacteria and the microfungi, and and they're going out and bringing the nutrients back. I think that's that's the paradigm shift to me <clears throat> is understanding what that plant's doing, what that bacteria, what those organisms in the soil are doing. And to me, that's the paradigm shift we need to understand more all the time. This is a couple pictures here of, I, I wish I had a lot of the pictures that Dr. White's got to use in a presentation this way because it's a lot better than what I've been able to find so far. Um, Microrhizobia and, and the fungi and the bacteria and, and everything that's, that's working in that soil. Here's a list of the cover crops that that we're using. Um, again, the, the those in black are are the ones in our regenerative operation. I've got a list of some of them in red there that we're using a lot of different species to do different things uh, in our organic operation. Uh, getting the cover crops established this fall was just a real challenge for us because we had a wet fall, we had a cold fall. Even those that we got in the ground or planted, uh, we didn't get, get a good establishment on them. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be working on, I don't know, plan E or plan F or something this, this spring to get the, the cover crop in the ground uh, to do the work that we need on, on weed control and, and nitrogen sources. We have a, uh, cattle operation where we're running about uh, between 80 and 100 brood cows. Uh, those cattle are fed out on our farm and and go through that meat market that the sons have. So it's uh, it's directly to consumers we're marketing at. Uh, hog operation where we're finishing uh, eight to nine thousand head of hogs a year 
on a contract finish program where we've got access to that hog manure to use in in the organic operation and, and that's really uh, going to be an, an instrumental piece I think in in the organic operation a um, couple pictures here Gabe talked about water infiltration and and we've seen the same thing this is after about an inch and eight tenths of rain it's been three or four springs ago um, I happened to drive by this field we probably got that inch and eight tenths in, in an hour's time it was pretty quick heavy rain <clears throat> this is a neighbor that this field was soybeans the previous year it's planted the corn right now after he field cultivated it three times now field cultivating bean stubble any to me is recreational tillage but three times I don't know what that's called outside of insane um, <laughs> the guy has learned a little bit from watching across the road because this is what turned around looking out the other side of that vehicle looked like it's uh, it's corn stalks that had cover crops on it corns planted in that field got the same rain on it but there's virtually no water standing there and that's years of no-till years of cover crops getting that soil structure right to where water infiltrates the way it should a um, little bit of some of the equipment that we build um, we started doing work with cover crops we wanted to seed cover crops before we start harvest and that's that's our goal that goal was not met this year because of a lot of different factors but um, we built started out with a 90 foot cover crop seeder and and built this one to 120 foot uh, Miller sprayer equipment company came to us and and asked us to build OEM units for them and in the meantime before that project got complete Miller sold out to New Holland so that projects our own right now but we did get a pretty nice 120 foot truss boom out of the deal so. Um, another piece that we build <clears throat> 60 foot uh, 24 row 28 percent nitrogen bar to to put nitrogen on corn at late stages I mean we're talking we've actually been in some corn for some neighbors of tassel high corn with this unit it's got six foot of clearance underneath it and, and we can go through 10 foot tall corn without any problems um, another piece this is not a piece we build but this is a piece in our organic operation uh, roller crimper um, that we use to, to roll crimp to terminate a lot of our our cover crops primarily cereal rye but some of the others we're starting to use will work that way too um, just one of the main pieces to our to our organic operation but it actually two years ago we eliminated one burn down pass on our regenerative operation because we were able to roll crimp about half of our half of our bean crop that year we, we were able to roll crimp the cereal rye and get it, get it down and, and actually got good weed control for a while we did end up post applying liberty because they're liberty seed beans and we have to put the liberty on them so um, that's kind of where we're at with that been working with the organic program and weed control um, this is a piece that we have developed we started out looking at, at uh, some different projects there's an electric shocker out there that would take any of you down and I don't want to be a part of that the only thing it's going to kill is what's up above the weed canopy and that's not where the where the weeds are normally going to be so we want to stay away from that we borrowed a uh, an eight row flamer from some good friends of ours tried it this spring if you've got organic no-till and you've got a good good crop of residue laying on top of the ground you can start one heck of a fire with that <laughs> so we at that point we'd been working on this idea at that point we kicked it into full gear um, 
developed this what we're calling a, a hot water heater weeder um, we've found a source to that we're generating hot water which we're looking at somewhere around 220 plus degrees and we're keeping it under pressure for a while but that's generated off of diesel fuel controlled with a 12 volt system strap it to the side of this sprayer and and we're building actually patented the hoods to to build to do this with um, we learned that from our cover crop seeders you better patent something or it's going to be taken over by somebody else and we're looking at at building this piece out to a 12 row unit for this spring uh, we've got two bigger bigger heaters coming on it we should be able to produce um, about 24 gallon of of hot water a minute for the operation and uh, we've got some work to do with with what nozzle setup we use on it how we how we control it and what kind of temperature we're going to need how fast we can run a lot of the details we've got to get worked out this spring we we introduced it at our field day which we have uh, this year on the 6th of September we had it had it put together for our field day then uh, and actually had it out in the in the field where it's sitting there right now and and the next morning there was uh, seven spots of dead grass where we'd been running it so we know it'll work uh, Klaus Martins came to our field day to speak for us and and he's really intrigued by this um, he, he told me at that time he says back in steam locomotive days they used to shoot the steam out the side of the locomotives to keep the vegetation down on the right-of-ways he said it'll work we just got to get the details worked out of how fast we can run it what we need to do with it but what's going on is we're using the hoods to protect the corner bean plants spraying the hot water underneath there and and uh, keeping keeping the operation going that way um, got a presentation tomorrow we can go more in detail on but I think that pretty much runs me out of time and and I thank Gabe for taking up and Gabe and Dr. White for taking up a lot of what I was wanting to say already which got me through in my allotted time so thank you all <clears throat>